Hello and welcome to Beta Blockers. Today we're going to talk a little bit about this very common medication that we give to lots of patients all the time and hopefully get a better understanding of what that beta blocker is and what it does for our patient. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. Hopefully we'll make this easy for you too. First of all, it's important to understand what a beta blocker does by understanding the sympathetic nervous system. So we have these two different parts of our nervous system that balance each other out, having some sympathetic and some parasympathetic activity. So when you look at the different pieces here, as we go on down through the pupils to the salivary glands, to the airways, the heart, etc., you'll notice that there is an opposite effect that we get with each one of these different places. So for example, with the parasympathetic system, we get constriction of the airways. Sympathetic system, we get relaxation. On the other hand though, just completely opposite type of effect is on the heart. Whereas with the heart, the sympathetic nervous system will increase the heart rate and it'll slow the heart rate if it's the parasympathetic system. One piece here that isn't explained well in this diagram is the effect that the sympathetic nervous system has on the vasculature. On the vasculature, the sympathetic nervous system is going to cause vasoconstriction. So now we put those two things together. We increase the heart rate and we cause vasoconstriction and that's going to increase blood pressure. So that would be a good thing if the blood pressure was low. And in fact, we get balancing going on here all the time. So every time you get up, like in the morning when you get up out of bed, the reason you don't pop up out of bed and pass out is because the sympathetic nervous system kicks in and it causes some vasoconstriction, increasing your heart rate, maintains your blood pressure. Otherwise, you'd probably just pop out of bed and pass out. There are a few different things that the sympathetic nervous system will do. So this diagram here is just simply illustrating the release of adrenaline or noradrenaline, so epinephrine or norepinephrine, and epinephrine rather, and the effects it has on some of the different body parts, uh, smooth muscle contraction, inhibits transmitter release, uh, we, we get more smooth muscle contraction, so we're getting it from more than one angle, and then we also have an effect on the heart. So there are different types of effects that are occurring. We've labeled these as being alpha and beta. Now, we're concerned about beta blockers, so we're going to take a look at just the beta part of this. The beta adrenergic system has two different components to it. It has beta 1 and beta 2. Beta 1 is concerned with the effect on the heart. Beta 2 is the effect on the airways and the vasculature. Some of our beta blockers Okay, so when you're thinking of beta blockers, don't make this difficult. They block beta. It's simple, right? Beta is the sympathetic adrenergic system. So we're blocking that with a beta blocker. And some of our beta blockers are very specific to trying to block mostly beta 1. Others are not, and they block both. The ones that are not, we might have some concern about whether or not that beta blocker could have an effect on the airway. So if our patient has COPD or asthma, we might be concerned about giving a beta blocker because that could cause the patient to have bronchoconstriction. Remember again, it, the parasympathetic system is causing bronchoconstriction, the sympathetic nervous system is causing bronchodilation. So if we're blocking the sympathetic nervous system, the beta piece, we could get airway constriction, and that would be bad in our COPD or asthma patient. So where do they work? Well, here is a list of our selective and non-selective types of beta blockers. 
Now again, even though these are selective for beta 1 and the ones that say here are non-selective, for example, let's talk about labetalol. So let's say we're going to give the patient some labetalol and we're a little concerned because the patient has a history of asthma or COPD. Well, there have been extensive studies that have looked at non-selective beta blockers and whether or not they're going to cause problems with our patient's breathing. And the overall outcome is that they really don't, in general, cause the patient to have difficulty breathing, so don't cause a lot of uh, bronchoconstriction. Now, this is particular to the patient. So some patients may and some patients may not. The reason I tell you this is because we may be giving a non-selective beta blocker like labetalol to a patient who has asthma. If the patient then starts to have some bronchoconstriction, obviously we would stop that medication and choose one that is selective for beta-1 or maybe even choose a different medication altogether and stay completely away from blocking the beta adrenergic system. But many of our patients who have COPD and asthma can also tolerate our non-selective beta blockers very well. So where does this sympathetic nervous system, where does this come in? Why would we ever need to give a beta blocker? Aren't these things supposed to be balanced with the sympathetic and parasympathetic system? Well, yes, they are. But one of the things that happens in our body is that we can have a system of decreased cardiac output. And when we have decreased cardiac output, that will stimulate compensation. So our body's going to say, okay, cardiac output's decreased because this patient has some cardiovascular disease, and so compensation is stimulated. Now, this doesn't have to be some dramatic type of occurrence that's going on, like cardiogenic shock or maybe a hypovolemic shock, for example. It could be just a minor decrease in cardiac output that occurs with having cardiovascular disease. So this patient is, you know, 75 years old. They've got some underlying cardiovascular disease. Not so much that it's causing the patient to have an MI, but enough that it's decreasing cardiac output. So the body senses that, stimulates compensation. We get these compensatory mechanisms kicking in, and they are going to maintain blood pressure and maybe maintain that patient's ability to be able to carry out their activities because of vasoconstriction and fluid retention. Now notice that one of those components is the sympathetic nervous system. So there's our beta kicking in over there on the sympathetic nervous system and it's causing the patient to have an increase in blood pressure and it's causing vasoconstriction. That may be a bad thing in our patients, so we may want to try to overcome that. Uh, let me give you an example of how that would be bad. If our patient's cardiac output is decreased because of a cardiac problem, the stimulation from the sympathetic nervous system is not going to help. If the heart is already compromised and we tell it to beat harder and faster, that's what the sympathetic nervous system does, that's not going to help. The heart's already compromised. It would if it could, but it can't. So in that case, we may want to turn off the sympathetic nervous system so that it's not making the patient worse. You see, that compensatory mechanism is there, and it kicks in all the time. It's designed for dehydration. It's designed for situations not like a cardiac situation. So that's why a lot of our cardiac patients are on beta blockers is because we want to block that sympathetic nervous system and that constant stimulation to have vasoconstriction and an increase in heart rate resulting in an increase in blood pressure. Sure, we want their blood pressure to be maintained, but the sympathetic nervous system is actually making that patient worse when they have a cardiac condition. So that's part we want to block. So some of the main effects we're going to get from our beta blockers are vasodilation. We expect to see a decrease in blood pressure and improve our circulatory flow because we're getting vasodilation. So we'd expect to see that. 
So when you're assessing the patient, you may see maybe the patient initially when you start beta blockers, they may become a little flushed. That would be a normal situation because we expect to see vasodilation. Slow the heart conduction, therefore we expect to see a slowing of the heart rate. It's often used to treat tachy dysrhythmias. In many cases, it may be used to, as a prophylactic to treat a migraine headache. They're often used in heart failure because we're using them to turn off that sympathetic nervous system, that compensatory mechanism. Some of the side effects are that it would have additive effects with other medications that are designed to decrease blood pressure, or slow the heart down. For example, digoxin is designed to slow and strengthen the force of contraction. So we give a beta blocker with that, and now we may get a little too slow because we're slowing that heart down and blocking the conduction through the electrical system. The same thing is true with calcium channel blockers, although calcium channel blockers can also lower blood pressure, and the combination of the two could result in having a very low blood pressure, a blood pressure that's lower than we'd expect or want. On blood pressure lowering medications like diuretics, etc., um, those may also have an additive effect. We talked a little bit about this bronchoconstriction worry, and that may happen in some patients. So we want to be careful about starting a beta blocker in a patient who has asthma or COPD because of the potential complication there. So we just want to go back in a few minutes and listen again to their breath sounds, make sure we're not starting to get some wheezing, which could indicate some bronchoconstriction is occurring. We could get some dizziness and lightheadedness as the patient starts on that new medication. Now, after the patient is on beta blockers for a while, they should become used to the changes that beta blockers occur, and the dizziness and lightheadedness will start to go away. If that persists after they've been on the medication for days and weeks, then we start to worry about uh, if something else may be going on, or maybe we need to change the dose or the medication itself. Hypoglycemia is a possible side effect as well. One of the other characteristics that occurs with that fight or flight response, the sympathetic nervous system is, the sympathetic nervous system will encourage glucose release. So if we're blocking that, we could end up having a low glucose, lower than we would ex expect. Some of the nursing considerations is to warn the patient not to stop taking the medication abruptly. So if this medication optimizes cardiac function and the patient stops taking it abruptly, that means that suddenly the patient's heart may have to start pumping against narrowed vasculature. The heart may start pumping or the heart may start beating a little bit faster and it could kind of run away from its oxygen supply. So overall, we don't want our patient to stop taking this medication abruptly and we want to make sure that we're telling our patients that, you know, please continue taking it. The, the other piece too is a lot of times our patients will stop taking the medication when they start feeling better. So, hey, I'm feeling better. I don't need this anymore. Or, I took my blood pressure this morning. It was fine. So I don't need to keep taking it. And the reason why you feel well, or the reason why the blood pressure is low, is because <laughs> you're taking the medication. So sometimes patients don't make that connection. And we need to let them know that this is something that you need to take every day, whether you're feeling poorly or not. Even if you're feeling well, you need to take it because that's what's making you feel well. Watch for orthostatic changes, so change positions slowly, because if they get up very quickly, they may find that they have a little bit of orthostatic hypotension. And follow-up is important. This is the kind of medication that is going to have cardiovascular effects. So we want to make sure that those cardiovascular effects are going to be beneficial for the patient and that the patient is not having side effects that could lead to additional complications. So make sure that we are educating our patients. This is one of those common medications that patients are quote unquote non-compliant with. So we need to be sure that we're talking to our patients about why it's important that they're taking this medication and why it's important that they continue taking it every day. Well, thank you for joining me for Beta Blockers. We'll continue our series with more talks about our medications with calcium channel blockers coming up next. Thanks for joining me again, and until next time, bye now.